Do you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. We're going to return this week to a topic that we come to regularly because we know it's huge to you, and that's the issue of if you're going to move from your home, where would you move? And usually that means a place perhaps of independent living, some sort of community, could be assisted living, and then there's a there's a category which a lot of us call nursing homes, which is you know skilled care. Skilled care, right? Yeah, and that you don't have much option. As. It's better than the old way of saying it, the old folks' home. Back yeah, in the, the day, old folks we don't home. say that anymore. But but we're going to focus more in this discussion about the option of moving into a community of independent living or assisted living. Um, and and we've on other shows we've talked about skilled care and skilled care is something where you have a choice as to where you go but you don't have a choice of going. By that I mean that's that's something you got to do. What what I think is more helpful is before you get to a point where you have to go into a place that gives you medical care in order to to survive presumably, you know, is that decision earlier where do you want to move out of your home, your neighborhood, which has lots of benefits? We get that, or do you want to? Uh, do you want to, to stay there or do you want to move into a place that would be more of a community? And and there are lots of those now. We know that. You've, I'm sure you're aware of several in the, those of you who are in the St. Louis area certainly are familiar with a number of options that exist here. But we wanted to go to somebody who's in a position to kind of speak from the inside, who actually owns, operates uh, several uh, facilities that provide independent living and, and assisted living. Uh, but more important than that, is in a position to speak to us frankly about, you know, what from an insider's perspective, what are some of the things that you might ask about? What are the, some of the concerns you might have? What are some of the considerations you didn't think about when you were when you're considering this move, which is becoming increasingly popular? You know, I think 25 years ago, everyone was determined to stay in their home. It was like Custer's last stand. Yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, they were determined. It was like the Alamo. That's a better I'm one. not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to die right here. And I get that. And some people still feel that way. I know my mother in particular <laughs> kind of leans that way. But we know many of you now, statistics tell us, many of you are saying, wait, this is not a dreaded sentence. This is an opportunity to have a new life, to have something full of adventure, right. maybe probably better food, recreation, friends, a very exciting, dynamic, fuller life. So we want to discuss that, and I'll let you introduce our wonderful guest this week, Jill. We have Tim Blano. He's the CEO and Executive Director of Twin Oaks. Welcome, Tim. And we had your wife and lovely mother-in-law, yeah. lovely wife too, on back in March. And they gave us the history of Twin Oaks. And if you could Go over that history. I'd I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, well, thank you. Because I know it started out me. very very small. It did. We we started. My mother in law started it um, in 1981, and it was just an idea to um, help seniors that didn't want to be in skilled because there was more skilled facilities than there were boarding homes, and that's what they were called in 1981. So right. Boarding. <laughs> yeah. so now, she, where was this first location? Uh, it was in O'Fallon, O'Fallon, where the facility is today. Okay. It was their home, and uh, she converted the house to a boarding home, and it served 12 people. And uh, it was just her, uh, her daughter. 12 people. Who you married, and your first job, from what I understand, your wife told us the last time on the show, your first job with this organization was mowing the lawns. That's right. You were only right. dating yeah, at the right. time. <laughs> Actually, her first daughter, Karen, was was the uh, first one to work at Twin Oaks. My daughter, or my wife, uh, the, she was the second daughter in line, if you will. So, um, but she helped out too. Right. But now, now you're the son-in-law, though, who is in charge of this vast enterprise at this stage. Yeah, I, I always say Marianne seen a, a diamond in the rough, and she she went ahead and took me on because <laughs> uh, I actually was working 
with handicapped uh, kids, uh, 18 to 21 year olds. And now, were they guests in this? I mean, they no, were no, it was a completely different program. And uh, I was like a gym teacher for them, and it was through high school uh, that I did it. And when I met my wife, now my wife, we were dating then. She's like, if you like doing this, you should meet my mom, you know. And so I did, and I thought I would help them for one summer. You know, they needed somebody to um, mow the grass and— General back, maintenance, or yeah, I, actually, my job was to also clean the s- septic system because we didn't even have city <laughs> oh water and sewer. Now that's then. starting we a, a son-in-law well. at the bottom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always say I really started to <laughs> ground up. You worked your way up that ladder, <laughs> but anyway, it uh, it just worked. You know, I mean, Marianne was a great mentor and is still a great mentor. So before we go further and talk about you know the course of of the development of Twin Oaks. Let's jump to the end so that people have a sense of where Twin Oaks is today. You have the still own the facility that you were just describing in, in Wentzville. Right. Oak Fallon. Oak Fallon. Right. That one's um, right off of Main Street there in Oak Fallon. And then in Wentzville, we have basically two locations in Wentzville. We have the uh, assisted living that's licensed for 60 people. And then we have the independent apartments. And then we have... Um, 32 homes, if you will, uh, individual, like villa homes. Gardens. Yeah, like individual houses. So um, the the facility that you started with uh, now has how many residents? I would say we serve right at 90 to 100 people when we're full because they're licensed for more than one. So the wow. license is, yeah. is larger than what you'll really be. But um, so, so, how yeah. many locations is this? You have three locations? Four. Four, four, today. four locations. So, we have uh, affordable apartments in Lake, Lake St. Louis off of Technology Drive. And then um, just right behind the Heritage Point location, we have Stone Ridge, which is another affordable community that has apartments and garden homes as well. And those are primarily independent living? Correct. Okay. And then you have some that are assisted but as we mentioned earlier, you all do not operate skilled care. When somebody comes to a point, if they come to a point where they need skilled care, which is, a, again, a traditional nursing home, then then you have places to which you refer them. So you do have relationships. Right, right. Okay. And, and, and we're fortunate in that, that homes like the Abbey, McClay Senior Care, those are, uh, that's all they do is skilled. Okay. You know, so so now let's go back. So... You're the uh, soon-to-be son-in-law in in early 80s. You have this one facility that had how many residents? Was it 12? 12, yeah. 12. 12. At what pace did you all expand? Well, she was pretty ambitious. So she opened in January of 81. I started with her in June. And then by 82, she wanted to do her first expansion. So we added on... Uh, what we call the East Hall in in 82. And then in 86, we opened another building. And then in 90, we built another building. And Now, what 90- was your job at that stage? I would say by 86, she started having me take over the um, – Personnel, so I was over ma- uh, personnel and maintenance. So you're no longer doing the septic tank. No, thank God. Were you married <laughs> ex- to your wife by then? We we got married in '84. Oh, okay. Yeah, right out of okay, high school. Okay, so you're definitely in the family by then. Yes, yes. So so you go straight into the family business. Yeah, matter of fact, it was funny because I worked for for Pepsi at the time too to to support us. But uh, Marianne told me right away she wanted to expand again. So. It was shortly right, like within a week of our marriage that we, I started at Twin Oaks full time. So now back. had you, uh, you had gone to college to be a teacher or I know no, you mentioned you're working with handicap, but. I No, I actually went to uh, St. Mary's College and I always did take gerontology and, and business. Oh, really? So you studied to do. Yeah. gerontology. So yeah, this was really... always a passion, would it you say? Is. Yeah. yeah. My mom used to tease because uh, I would play hooky and say I was sick because once a month she would do bingos at a home. It was a group home in Harvester. Mm-hmm. And I would play sick those days because I would help the residents there with their bingo cards and all that. I so, love it. 
Um, so actually, that was my first experience with seniors. Was back so um, that was a very About nine or ten. That was a very prescient decision to gerontology in the early eighties. It yeah. wasn't apparent. Though I guess you could look at demographic trends, but it certainly wasn't apparent to most people that gerontology would become such a huge field right. oh, as it is right. today. Yeah, you're very right. And, you know, I, I just feel like sometimes God just puts you in the right place. I, I will never understood mm-hmm. Stan, how that happened, but it did, you know. And she was a great mentor. You know, I learned more through Marianne than I did anywhere else. Marianne is. My mother-in-law, yeah. the one who started doing yeah. us. Yeah. So um, you opened then uh, one additional facility. The next facility you opened after the one that you had in Lake St. Louis was which one? So Heritage Point, we opened in 2009. That was the first large facility that we opened other than Twin Oaks. And then uh, Stone Ridge, we did in 2013. And then 2016, we did... Lake Ridge. So you you grew largely in your existing locations up till that point, up until the, in say the Charles first County. yeah the, the first decade of the twenty first century. Prior to that, you were expanding on pretty much your existing correct location. So what happened where you made the decision to suddenly, I, I would call it a growth spurt that occurred. It sounds like from twenty ten to today. I would say it was almost miraculous because if we were invited out to Winsville, so a contractor was beginning to struggle. And it was right at the beginning of the downturn. You know, you remember 2008. Oh, yeah. yeah. Backwards. And so we actually were invited out there to look at a project that was not doing well. And... So we fell in love with the location right away. And, so and these really were independent fit. units. It was built to be independent units. Right. It was going to be a townhome subdivision. Okay. And so when we looked at it and then they asked to stay on and be partners with us. And they are actually still our partners today. They're minority partners. So you all agreed then that you would buy it uh, and, and you, your intention was to use it for independent living. Correct. Uh, and, and you bought it at a time where it must have been a very favorable price if we're talking about 2010. No. You know, and that was the that was the thing. You know, we probably paid well over what it would normally be. What know? year was this? It was 2006 or seven when oh, it started. Oh, yeah, before, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so we okay. hit it at the peak. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. by the time, you know, we were totally all in because we had invested all we could, you know, to get it off the ground and get all the the loans and, you know, get the architectural, everything done. So we were really deep in it at that point by the time that the downturn happened in 2008. So there was no going back. But I will say that <clears throat> that was one of those faith moments. You know, you had to believe that what we were doing right. was the right thing. And um, and we did. We, f- we filled that community in, uh, in less than six months. So even though you, in effect, overpaid, and I know what you mean, uh, it was a time when prices were at their lar- their highest, uh, but at least you had a partner who was in the same boat. Yeah, right. So uh, you all both were managed to to turn this into a very good decision. So uh, despite those things, and that must have emboldened you to do another project. It did. That gave us a lot of confidence. And, you know, even with the state, as they would come out and visit our project and and see the challenges that we had to go through, and it, it really, I think that was the first really strong relationship, or one of the fa- really strong relationships, I, I think, with the state licensing agency, the Department of Health and Senior Services and others. You know, it was... Um, And also, you know, we had other people contact us. Hey, would you consider doing a project here? And people from Missouri, other parts of Missouri would come out and look at the project and want to imitate some of those things that we did. So Hmm. So let's talk, though, a little bit about that process of of, um, licensing and whatnot, because I'm looking for opportunities in this conversation so that people can learn not only about, about Twin Oak, but also they can understand other places that they might be looking at if they're not in this area. 
um, or and they can better understand Twin Oaks. So when whenever companies or people decide to enter this field, they there it's a very regulated, I assume, both from the federal level as well as on the state level. Um, can you just talk to the layperson a little bit about, you know, in order to decide that you're going to provide independent or assisted living, it's more than simply building apartments. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Can you just talk about that for a few minutes? So we're actually licensed at the state level only, like skilled facilities are licensed and have a federal and state license, but we don't accept any federal funds. So assisted living, residential care, when you hear that term, they're all licensed strictly and inspected by state inspectors, no federal inspectors. But it does require that you have a certificate of need. So basically what you do is typically you would have an attorney represent you and you would do your own due diligence to show the need um, and why you're making this decision. So the state will not certify it unless they believe that there is a demand for it in that area. Is that true? That's correct. That part of the state? That's the way it's supposed to go, right. You have to show financial viability that you can do this project. You have to show um, that there's a need in the area. It's based on 65 and older. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that that process is much easier now than it used to be, but... So what are the advantages, though, of deciding to forego the federal requirements? And, or I'll put it differently. Why would someone bother um, pursuing the federal requirements, since I'm sure that comes with a lot more red tape? What's the advantage to that, or is there? There's not as much advantage now. You know, if you were talking, if we were sitting here with a skilled operator and myself, he would tell you there's not as much advantage of being skilled. Um, but because we do do hospice, you know, that's something that we would have never done many years ago with residential care. So in assisted living, you can do that. Um, I see. You can do some rehab, but you do need to make sure that the person is minimal assist. But from a standpoint of insurance and Medicare, you know, it's hard to get it. You can't get any reimbursements in assisted living or residential care or skilled yeah. care. The reason why you'd want that model okay. is that's where the reimbursement level is. So, okay, I think I get it. So the the people should can understand that if, if a facility is going to provide services that are going to have some Medicaid or Medicare eligibility, then that's going to require getting this federal certification, uh, which is really just skilled care. So it's it, there would be no incentive if you're not doing skilled care, which again is nursing homes. If you're not doing that, then there is no reason to seek federal. Right. Okay, I get it. And I always say honestly that we complement each other because we provide an environment that skilled facilities I don't feel can provide. No, they can't. Right. Because they they feel. I mean, their people are often not in a physical condition right. to enjoy many of those things. Is that true? Right. And and they provide an environment that we can't really provide. I mean, in the sense that if, you know, if somebody truly is bedridden and maybe, you know, tube feedings, things like that, they're going to be have a more skilled staff and that's right. their dedication. Where our residents are going to be more ambulatory, um, more alert and oriented also for the most part. I mean, we certainly have memory care units and things, but they're they're still going to be much more active than the skill. So when whenever you're building out a facility or deciding to change your facility, um, what are the things that, that you and your team think about people are going to want in an independent living or assisted living? What is really important to you guys from the standpoint of recreational activities or or the quality of the food or tell me how your decision making works because anything you add in terms of amenities costs money mm. and there's so many different amenities you could add how do you decide the ones that you think are most important i, I really say it's resident driven because um, one of the things that's helped me over the years is in every community, whether it's the affordable community, the assisted, um, the independent, 
uh, market rate communities is I go into every facility. I have We have regular resident council meetings. We meet every month, sometimes multiple times a month. Um, during COVID, it was much more than that, it seemed like. Sure. Um, but it was really understanding what they want and what their needs are. You know, I always thought the swimming pool, for instance, is going to be the biggest thing that has to be in their list of priorities. It was actually way, way down the list. Really? Right? I can see that. But I'm a person who doesn't swim a lot. Would you you see yourself using a pool a lot? I do. Well, you know, if I'm 70, maybe I wouldn't have say I, w- I had some health problems or had trouble, you know, being mobile. But, yeah, I, I love the pool. Yeah. And I'm not saying it wouldn't be something they don't want. Certainly they do. But on the list of priorities, right. it was um, movie theater. Really? Uh, it was. I get that. Yeah. I completely get that. It was that spiritual guidance, right? So Mm -hmm. each of our communities has a chapel. Oh, that's great. Um, And I understand that too. Yeah. That would, I would, that would, I would think would be toward the top of the list. Yeah. Um, You know, and I could go on, but I mean, those are honestly where I, I've learned so much in asking them and, you know, food certainly is, is a big thing, you know. Now let's talk about food. It, on the one hand, you have an environment to where you're having to cook a lot of food for a lot of people. It's almost like, I don't want to compare it to a cruise ship, but I understand the challenge of a cruise ship. Is on the one hand, they want to provide gourmet food, but gourmet food's expensive, but also it requires a lot of people uh, to, to be involved in the preparation and main, cutting and, and, and shopping and all those things that are required. And you often have a turnover pace where it's not possible to the time necessary to prepare and to serve, et cetera, um, and all to do that with a tight budget. Mm-hmm. So um, there are probably some similarities. So how do you, though, um, decide what is the balance between affordability and great food? Uh, I do think a, a, a great chef makes all the difference. Um, we are really blessed in that sense that uh, John Ruggieri, I don't know if you've been to Ruggieri's restaurant. I remember Marianne and Kathy talking about the chef on the last show, right. Uh, yeah, he yeah. was, or is just incredible and his whole family is. I mean, we we have four of his family members in different aspects that, are, that work in our business. Um, but, you know, they had a restaurant down in St. Louis right Next to Ballpark Village. What was the name of it? Um, I forgot. Geo's, this. I think it was. Geo's? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. sure. Um, but when Ballpark Village expanded, just didn't make it viable. Um, but they just have a way, you know, and understanding. And in and, and O'Fallon, too, you know, our, our dietary staff there is it's over 20 years, you know. So I go back to what I said before about listening to the resident. So we have a resident council that also has like what we call the food. So what are your interests? Because it's changed. I mean, it's changed a lot from this generation to the generation that I had in 1981. Now, tell me how it's changed, though. Are the higher standards? Well, I I think that, certainly. But, you know, pizza, things like that probably wouldn't have been such a big deal back then. I mean, they it was more strictly... Meat and Steak potatoes. and potatoes. Yeah, right, it really right. was. Um, but also now it's like, you you know, people want hamburgers, pizza, chicken tenders. You know, it's like not that that's not where we go all the time. But, you know, you got to have that as options and things where I don't think we would have ever put that as an option right. before, right? I mean, I think we would have – nobody even heard of chicken tenders kind of. <laughs> 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 but he, he will – fillet and do things, you know, that I didn't think was possible. So you have this chef that has some reputation here in St. Louis. Um, now, but he's at one location or does he right. play a he's role? he's at one, but okay. he does try to help out and give Influence. culinary. Yeah, because like his lasagnas and and the other dishes, I mean, they're very exotic. Oh, you're making dishes. me hungry. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but still though, you have to... On the one hand, you're wanting to make this affordable for people because people, maybe even the most insistent thing they say is, is this place needs to be a place I can mm-hmm. afford to live. But 
you know, when people are asked, they say food's hugely important. And I'm not surprised to hear that. So your challenge is to provide really good food by really by a prominent chef and at the same time make it affordable. And and I do feel like COVID has changed that a little bit. I mean, things, you know, we've always been more of a try to be a fresh or frozen type. You know, our vegetables are frozen very – we try to eliminate or as much as possible canned goods, things like that. But um, – it has been a challenge to get that supply now that, you know, the trucking yeah. industry and that has made it more difficult. But we try to pick menus that we think the residents really, really want in a much more macro way. And I have to ask you, uh, when Marianne was, and Kathy were on the show, Marianne said you have a low employee turnover rate, but now we are experiencing this uh, worker shortage. Has that impacted Twin Oaks at all in recent months? You know, um, and this is one of those where I get choked up a little bit, but 27% is what our turnover rate is. It has not changed. And if anything, I feel like in some ways we've been blessed to even be – our relationships got stronger with the employees. I think if you'd ask them, they'd say the same thing. And you've had some of the same employees for 39 years, Correct. Yeah. Practically since the get-go, yeah. which is really, really true. unheard of. So when you say 29% uh, or 25%, what'd you say? It's right in that 27 to 29%, depending on which location you're talking about. But that's but, over what period of time? Uh, over a year. You know, yeah. I mean, there's there's facilities right now, and, you know, I don't know how much you get to read about those, but they're experiencing 100% turnover. Right. I mean, it is it is really yeah. tough. Yeah, and... and, and it's good we pause here because I'll be honest with you. I, I when you said that I'm thinking, I don't know if that sounds so good, but but when you put it in context as you just did, 25, 26, 29 percent is is an incredible oh. number. Given when you keep in mind these are the very workers that the articles are written about who tend to change jobs like that. Right. Uh, there was legislation just passed. I don't know if you said it was in the post. It was actually before the CON committee earlier this last year, but um, where homes have the option to suspend their facility for two years and still keep their license. That's never been before. If you closed, you know, you had X number of months and you had to be open or you had to reapply for a license. Start over. Start over, yeah. But a lot of that is being driven by, you know, the employee situation, they, they're not able to do it in some of the rural areas, the low census in the facilities, uh, because more people are staying at home. Out COVID. of fear or? Mm-hmm. Fear of COVID. Um, and it, it it's really created a, a very, and then, you know, the requirement now on skilled facilities that they must be vaccinated, all employees, that has really been very difficult on them. So I just... You know, I, I can't tell you how blessed we are. I mean, yeah. And uh, so you've not had to close any facilities. Everything's no, operating as it otherwise would. No, we've never used agencies, which is also a blessing too. Because that can. Do be- you still have waiting list with some of your facilities? We do. Yeah, Winsville operates with a waiting list. O'Fallon has a few openings, but that's amazing. Yeah, because I know that many are struggling with vacancies. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, when when you when you think about kind of the the challenges you you face, and we all know that there's there's inflation, um, I know that you're paying more in your labor costs than you paid eighteen mm-hmm. months ago. Not to mention your food costs and pretty much everything. How do you avoid passing that along? And maybe you've you've simply had to pass it along. Do you have do you have contracts in place? And this is a good thing for us to talk about too. Is you know. What are some of the options people will run into when they think about living in an independent or long-term care facility regarding um, the payment relationship? Is it typically one-year leases? Is it typically that they pay a front-end fee and then they pay a smaller amount monthly? First answer to how you guys do it, how Twin Oaks does it. But then if you would comment on alternative plans that you're familiar with and give your thoughts. I would see everybody in the field has experienced 
increases. So They have to. Yeah. I don't think anyone in our field is not going to have to, you know, pass some of that on. I mean, it just is. We've always believed in the model where you come to Twin Oaks, you have one fee, and that includes all of our services. But it's a, it's a monthly fee? It's a one monthly okay. fee. So we don't have a tiered system. Um, what does that mean? Well, so let's say you came in and maybe in the beginning you needed very little assistance, um, maybe just simple guidance, medication administration. Then if you only have so many medications, you're at tier one. If you have a more comprehensive um, medication plan uh, or you need assistance with special diet, bathing, uh, things like that, you might be at a two, tier three, four, or five, depending on what the level is that you need. So that's an important question to be asking when you're looking at communities because oftentimes that can graduate very quickly and in some cases almost double your rate that you think you're going to be yeah. at. So. Okay, and you have your model is you charge a flat rate and whatever of those additional levels of service are it's needed. All it's encompassed. Right. And I, I've, it's worked for us for 40 years. And I find that most people, we post our rates on our website so people know before they even call what that rate's going to be. But that's always just seemed to be a more upfront model and it's easier for people to budget and plan. So, you know. but is there a difference though between independent and assisted in your rate? Yes, our okay. independent is certainly going to be less expensive, but it operates the same way. So it includes, you know, the whole campus, transportation, um, multiple meals a day, housekeeping, um, the clubhouse, theater, everything. Yeah, all the all of the amenities are included. Correct for independent living and services. You know, uh, it's all under one fee. And typically on uh, when facilities have a flat fee, will that include three meals a day or is it two meals a day? What so on it? the assisted side, um, that includes personal laundry. We do laundry daily. We housekeep the rooms daily. And you don't charge extra for that from no. what I understand, right? Right. It includes um, beautician service. So we'll come in and wash and set their hair right. before the weekend. We always like to do that medication administration, showers, any of their ADLs that they would need assistance with. ADLs are? Activities of daily living, so all the, the things that they would need assistance with. Um, so under assisted living, that's all in one fee. And and it would be two meals a day or three meals? Three a, meals. Three meals three a meals. day. Three meals a day. And then on independent living, it would be usually two meals. Some come in later than others if they sleep in, but it's a two meal. Yeah, and people probably go out and eat some. They so. do, yeah. And they, they have that, you know, you got some great chefs of your own in there, so they have their own system, especially on the affordable side. I love going over there for celebrations because we, we typically uh, cook a turkey, you know, for Thanksgiving, we'll be cooking turkeys for them, and then we have a big meal in their main building, and they bring little dishes. It's a lot of fun down there. So mm. kind of like a potluck. It is. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about, though, at the costs that come along, like in this situation? I mean, across America, pretty much any independent living, assisted living, and I imagine for that matter, even skilled care, are facing incredible increase in costs. Are they a, pretty much... All of them are able to pass that along, or do some of them operate with long-term contracts that may not for that may forbid that? Um, you know, I would I don't know how I, we typically try to hold ours for twelve months. That is how we. So you all ours generally up. do twelve months. We do, especially on the independent side. I would say some people have you know inflation things that are out of their control built into their contract to allow yeah. for some of those yeah. adjustments. Yeah, whatever the rate of inflation they um, can adjust. We have been able to build that in. Now, certainly, we're coming up on our, we do it by calendar year. Um, so we will have some increases as well. I, I think what most people didn't see is even insurance was so affected. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it was, we probably experienced... 
a 25% increase. And when you're thinking in terms of, of our buildings and the size that they are, right. it was... Yeah. But, you know, I'm finding that people are being pretty compliant or I should say acquiescent about the price increases. Um, I'm seeing it. Restaurants, of course, have done it. Law firms have done it. I can tell you that our our firm has had to increase rates. Um, and a number of retailers have commented as well that people know there's inflation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people expect that they're going to be able to sign a new contract at the same price that they did a right. year ago. Right. Even things like, you know, the HVAC. I mean, it's amazing to me how long, if you order a furnace today, how long it takes to get that in yeah. and at the cost that it is. We, we, I'm just throwing this out, but we replaced, you know, several units and it was almost double. And we were waiting, in some cases, three months. So we had to really get creative. So now, you know, instead of ordering a unit like we would and the guys would come in, we order, you know, five at a time now. And we store them ourselves. Store them, and that's a good so idea. That when the time comes, we're ready to go. But those that, are infrastructure costs, capital costs that you just don't think you're going to be making, right? So yeah, yeah, and have your money tied up, right? Uh, that's becoming increasingly common. I, I wish I could think of a clever article I read the other day, but it's a play on words. It was used to just in time, and uh, and they it's a play on those words about now it's just the opposite. Just in time is based on the idea that you always have arranged for something to be delivered just when you need it. Mm. So inventory, you wouldn't keep any inventory because now, so it was thought, the world is so sophisticated, our supply chain chains so sophisticated that everything can be delivered the momentary. So you don't have to carry, you don't have carrying costs. Right. Now we know that's out the window. So now people don't trust supply chains anymore. This will probably go on for years. And so, like you, if they have to use, if they have to order one thing, yours isn't what I'd call inventory. But it's the same point. If they have to have one thing, they'll turn around and order five. Just right. because, and and what it results in, oddly enough, is a shortage. But yeah. I mean, worse yeah. than it was because if everyone's going to do that, it's like um, whenever you have a, a threatened famine or something. What do people do? They hoard. Right. Mm -hmm. And and it's human nature. So if you think that you're going to need air conditioners. You order five. Well, it, it and you're almost required to, you know. I mean, it that was on the advice of of our HVAC people, you know. Yeah. So, you know, those are critical. What I call critical care things that you need. You to can't keep go without. People right. Relates to health, right? Um, when it comes to PPE and you know disinfects, that's better now than it than it was. But we still keep at least a month's supply in hand. I mean, that's, so and for us, that's thousands, you yeah. know, of masks and so forth. But so when, and during COVID, we were pre-playing a plane to go get the mask and bring them back to us. Is that right? A plane? Was, there was a group of homes and um, actually the police department, the fire department, say, uh, the EMS, we were prepaying this company to, because they said, if you prepay, we'll guarantee that you'll get it. So we had to prepay the, the load. Everybody, you know, pulled together, prepaid it and bought the mask. And because they were being seized, if it was in a container ship, it was being seized by the federal government because they needed them. So I'm certain wow. they were paying for it, but they were seizing it. So the only way was to actually prepay for the plane to bring it all the way to St. Louis and know that it actually made it into St. Louis. Some crazy times we're living in. <laughs> I mean... You just wouldn't think that, but it's yeah. exactly what... So what do you foresee for your um, industry? And I'm asking this question not from the standpoint of investors, because the people watching this show are more likely to be residents than investors. But I can see where they might wonder... Well, what is this field going to look like over the next 10 years? Is it being overbuilt? Because it, it seemed like there were, at one time, there were more facilities going up maybe than there was demand several, fewer, four, three or four years ago, let's say. Uh, what do you project in terms of that relationship between supply and demand over the next five to 10 years? 
That's always in the eye of the beholder, right? Because I'm at the CON hearings and you hear those discussions go What's on. What's a CON hearing? Uh, Certificate of Need hearings in Jeff okay. City. He speaks in acronyms. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I forget that. No, you use um, it a lot. So I would say, you know, we're right into the baby boomers. And right. we're just in the beginning of that. I think for the immediate need right now, we are certainly overbuilt. I don't think any operator would tell you the opposite. Set five to eight years from now, you know, I think certainly we'll be absorbing all those. So uh, there'll beds. be a second wave. Of right. Baby because boomers. right now, you know, I think there's what, 10,000, is it 10,000 a day or turning 65? Yeah, I've heard that. So, but those are 65. The median age for our community, especially in assisted living, is going to be the mid 80s. That's an important point. Go ahead and finish the point you're making, but I want to talk about the ages of the people in the, these facilities. So the independent is probably, I would say, more in the mid-70s. So the need is going to be there, but right now, you know, the majority of the homes in St. Louis and St. Charles County are operating below 70%, which that's not good for all the all the reasons you can imagine. What right? do they need in order to be profitable? And I know you're guessing, but what would you say roughly these facilities probably need? Over 80%. Certainly in that 85, I think. I mean, that's where we probably are more conservative. So, but I would say certainly, you know, we need to be in the 80s. And I suspect operates. they do. So it makes me wonder how long can some of these carry on in the red? You know, Missouri is probably still, I would say, close to 70% private owned, at least for assisted living. So, As opposed to chain or right. large right. national. And they are struggling. I represent, I'm part of a, an association called Missouri Assisted Living Association. So I'm on that board. And so we represent all the assisted livings and residential care facilities. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of them struggle right now. Um, and they're making some tough choices of whether they're going to stay open, especially in the rural areas. Yeah, um, yeah. But some in the in the St. Louis metropolitan area too, just because they can't. Is there an advantage to, to selling to a national brand or to have a, in the hotel business, they call it like a flag uh, where you, you sign on with a Hilton or some other flag right. that you would bear and and supposedly it. That's certainly happening because I think the national, you know, REITs and things like that see real value in how that facility was run and the personal aspect that that family or, per, you know, person brought to it. But, you know, like any merger, you have a new way of doing business, and it's and it's their way of doing business. I, I've always felt that Twin Oaks' strength is our family. I mean, yeah. you know, we make decisions, and we've always been able to make decisions based on the care needs first, and the you know, the the money follows. It's like it's always worked for us, and um, that's one of the reasons why we did the affordable and the market rate communities because we weren't looking just for all of us of care to make sure we can, we were also trying to look at the financial s situations of, of the people and um, it has worked well for us. And it hasn't been um, of huge importance to make a, a major profit. Right. And, yeah. uh, and again, I, I, I keep saying it, it really, that's why we probably need those high occupancies because our margin is going to be, you know, probably closer than some facilities. I don't know, but... Well, it gives you, you don't have to report to investors, quote unquote. Correct. And it, and it does, um, it does allow you more discretion about how much money you want to take home. And um, I see that as being a characteristic of small businesses that are often, and not necessarily small, but businesses that are not part of a national organization. Um, I see that as a benefit that's often overlooked is when you have a company that's owned by a family or one or two individuals, um, especially families, is that they often don't insist on the level of profit that they could because the family is probably making enough money 
and that's more than they need. And so they can afford to be casual about not wringing every dollar out of the business. Whereas if, if that business, and I'll say law firm, if that law firm or your business were purchased by a national organization with, with hundreds of shareholders, then, you know, they've got a, their duty, their fiduciary mm-hmm. duty right. is to wring every dollar they can out of that business. That's, that's their job. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean cheating customers or anything like that. Sure. Matter of sure. fact, they, they may provide wonderful service, but it's right. going to all be driven. It's going to all be driven by maximizing profitability. So I get the point you're saying, and, and that's, that's not just um, what? Uh, salesmanship for a small business. I mean, it really is true, and I've seen it, quite frankly, in our family. I feel like it's the success because it's the same people you go to church with, right? Same people that live down the street. You know, it's like you're living in that community. You're going to church with that community. Those are the same people that are calling you and saying, boy, my mom really needs help. Could you guide me? What do I need to do? And oftentimes, I can't. Like, they might need a higher level of care. Uh, than I can provide. Or maybe it's just, I feel like we can help you where you're at right now because some people aren't ready to make that change. They just need help guidance in their home. But that again is the beauty of of having your own facility and your own opera because you can make those decisions without fear or worry of I didn't meet my my quota or my my numbers that month or so again, if you were advising a a viewer and they were, let's put aside your facility for a minute, um, should they be concerned about the occupancy rate of a facility that they're looking at? Should they be asking questions about um, whether this business is secure enough to be around for 10 plus years? Yes, and because any time a facility is operating with low, low census, they got to make some decisions, tough decisions, and so it might be mean, you know, we're going to adjust our activities. Maybe they don't have as much activities as they did before. Maybe their staffing might be cut, or maybe they don't have as much professional staff as they had. That's where I think it's really important because. You know, again, I just we operate with with a nurse twenty four hours around the clock, seven days a week. You don't, you're not required to do that. You can operate, um, depending on what the census is of your building, maybe thirty hours of professional nursing in a assisted living. But those are important questions to ask because if mom's having a reaction or mom's having problems, the nurse aide is going to say the nurse will be here in five minutes. Or somebody else may say, we're going to watch you and the nurse will see you tomorrow morning when she comes in. You know, it might be a pretty facility, brand new bricks and mortar, but you want to make sure what's their care model, you know. Right. Um, I will always, it meet your loved one's needs? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, but how would you detect all those little ways that you just mentioned where – I ha- where they have a lower census, and as a result, they're having to cut back on certain things, and that can be manifested in a lot of ways, ways that are pretty subtle to find. It's like shrinkflation. Have you heard that phrase? Mm-hmm. No. It's where it's where they don't change the price of something because of inflation. The, the price is the same, so you think, oh, there's been no inflation, but they, they have a smaller container or they've cut back on services. Or an example is if you go to a hotel, they don't change your linens every mm-hmm. day. I mean, that's that's what you you might call shrinkflation, meaning the price of your room may be the same, but there's been inflation because now you don't get the same level of service. Right. So somebody looking at a facility that's struggling with a, with a census level that, say, is below 70%, and all of those are good points because like you just said, you know, for instance, I was telling you we do, we're in the room every day. So we, we do wash all their personal laundry every day. That way you never have odors, things like that building up in your facility. We housekeep the room every day, bathrooms, carpet, the whole nine yards. We do it every day. That's one of those ways, again, where you might say it's now weekly. We don't, but I'm just saying I've, I've heard right, this many right. times that housekeeping is done weekly. So... Those are always concerning to me because people just have accidents, you know. And I'm sure that they are cleaning up the accidents. I'm not inferring that there isn't. But but I'm saying weekly housekeeping does mean 
it's not being done every day that it was the way it was before when they originally started. See, these are things that people don't know. And that's the reason you're kind of a wonderful guest is because you, you as an industry insider, you know, you can, you would know to look for these things, but many people wouldn't. And you guys have had the good fortune to where you've, you've had, you know, good census plus your family owned, So you have some flexibility there, Mm -hmm. but many of the people watching, if, you know, first of all, I, I would, say, and I think that they've gotten the message that that Twin Oaks is perhaps they should consider. But many, for various reasons, will be looking at facilities that, you know, they they may or may not be nationally owned. They could be family owned and still face some of these challenges. Sure. Uh, so, and I would say this, at least nationally owned, maybe it has the advantage that often there are deeper pockets. What, might you concede that? Sometimes, not always, yeah. but no, I agree. sometimes. So it might mean they can run in the red a little longer, perhaps. But there's still the obligation I mentioned early, and that's the ring every dollar they can in terms of profitability. But uh, I guess what I want people to walk away with is a willingness that when they go into these, if they're looking at other facilities, that that they ask these questions. Um, and and you gave a couple of examples. You know, what about bed linens? You know, how often are they changed? What other thing areas that they might they ask about that would be things where you could cut back without ha- doing fundamental harm? Well, I, I mean, I certainly think activities is one. You know, some everybody's budget is different. Yeah, um, for activities instance, like budget. coach buses. You know, we have coach buses, so we do away activities. We do in-house activities. You're trying to do activities during the day. You're trying to do activities during the evening. Um, those are a lot of times one of those places where or you, they they're going to cut back. They might not have as many paid guests as they were going to have before. So it's Paid always guests? Real, Is that what you said? Right. Saying? Like we'll have uh, singers come in, musicians. Oh, and, entertainers. Yeah. Right. Different, you know, uh, during COVID, we had to really get creative. You know, I mean, we had... Uh, the oh, bubble the, bus coming and different out in the things. Parking lot, right? Because yeah. we were trying to, you know, just make the day a lot better, but yet try to keep that distance, right? So sometimes that got a little expensive. But oh yeah. So I'm just saying, there's a lot of things like that. That activities, it's it's always an important thing to see what kind of activity program is really going on there. Right. And, um, what about staff as a ratio, staff to to guest or to resident? That's probably something they could they could ask if that has changed. And you know, I I certainly uh, so in, let's say an assisted living, you can operate one to twenty. Okay, one staff member, and when that when that ratio said, that's, of one to twenty, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a nurse aide. It could be dietary is counted into that staffing, housekeeping stuff. So. Effectively, let's say Twin Oaks, uh, you could have pff, four four people, you know, easily on on shift, and and that's more than you need, right? But we couldn't operate with four, you know. We probably have twenty people on during the day. So the so, state standards are, can't be relied upon. It should really be a better ratio than that. Is that what you would argue? Right. Right. So I, that's, but I'm, again, that's where you have minimums, but you also have needs that are higher than that. So, um, so I always, I always look at that. I look at the, if, if I'm looking at a facility and I think it's what you're asking me, I, I look at how long has the staff been there? Um, staff I'd turnover. Like to, yeah. I would always encourage people to, uh, talk to the staff when they're yeah. At least see how pleasant they are, how much they know about the residents there, how much they know about the community. Because you can kind of tell quickly if this is somebody who's new or or not. Yeah. Um, uh, huh. Turnover, though. That's an interest. I wouldn't have thought of that. But you're right. Yeah. That's a good. Um, and the ratio, just to clarify the point you made, um, I think you were saying that it, it is important to know if the ratio has changed. But you, it's not enough to simply know the number of bodies in terms of people, you right. know, workers to residents, because also it's the quality of the position. So you could technically have the same ratio, but one could be an unskilled worker that replaced a nurse aide. 
for example. That's or, correct. I mean, that's why you really want to make sure that that minimum, in my opinion, that minimum staffing, that's just for m- medical staff, caring staff. Right. Um, I see. So you would expect something substantially better as a ratio. Huh. That is uh, interesting to know. that, And people just have to... Um, and often it's family members, and we mentioned ages a while ago, so let's talk just briefly about that. When it's people coming to you to consider independent living, is it usually driven by the, the parent? Is it the initial contact, one of the people who will, I say parent, one of the people who will actually be a resident? Or is it often perhaps an adult child of the person that would be a resident? What do you see usually? I would definitely say it's probably more driven by the family member, a, a daughter, a son, a nephew. Um, in some cases, it is driven by, you know, the resident themselves. They realize that, hey, I need more assistance. Um, I love it when they are because they always have great questions, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're taking charge, charge of, of what they're, de- you know, that decision. Um, but many times I would say, it's the family member saying, man, you know, I've, I've noticed this in mom or dad. I'm getting a little more concerned. What can you offer and how can I talk to mom or dad about this? So and, you may talk to them first before you e- even meet. Yeah, and I always try to tell people right away, this isn't, you know, an address change. This is a life change. Yeah, so, a good way of putting it. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. So, you know, and never use the words forever and always, you know, when you're considering having that discussion with mom or dad because those are very definitive words, right? So scary. mom right now or dad right now, you need some assistance. This is a good place. And then let that conversation, you know, happen and let them ask those questions and then meet them where they're at right then, you know, because in some cases they do make it back. But um, I think it's important that people not feel locked in, you know, that, and yeah. I always tell people when they come, you know, and I think most facilities will, you're driving this, our, you know, that's one thing great about care is it's, the model has changed. I do feel like the residents, it is more resident driven and the residents driving their yes. services versus a facility saying this is what's yes. going to happen. So, yeah. but would you say though that for independent living, you have a higher percent of initial contacts with the actual resident versus assisted living, or is it about the same? On independent? Independent versus assisted. On independent, it's just the opposite. Okay. I feel like on independent, it is the resident coming in the first time and then wanting to know all about the services and tour, maybe have meals, um, and then tell us their son or daughter, I want you to come out. And... Yeah. So I'm curious what percent of your residents end up having to go to some sort of skilled care uh, versus always being sufficiently functional to be able to live in assisted living up until the day they die, which I think many of us, as far most of us would rather be an independent living, live a long life, and then die an in independent living. Yeah, and that does happen sometimes. We do hospice there as well through, you know, through home health and uh-huh. other assistance, but... It, it you know I don't have the exact number percentage wise, but I would say you know more times than not, we are that bridge. So between, more than fifty percent of the time, you think someone does go on to d- skilled care. Right, we do do hospice, and, and many times they're able to to stay with us, and that's always their wish when we have that conversation. Is hey. I really would like to be able to stay here. And then we sit down as, you know, as a family and talk that through what that's going to involve in the care. It's going to have to be increased in how we do that. Yeah. Um, but I always say we can't do what skilled does. You know, if somebody truly is bedridden and it's a long-term thing, like it's not a cancer or it's not a hospice situation, um, we need to bow to what they do so well and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and and we make those arrangements with the family, but but most cases they do want to stay. I mean, and we try to make that happen as long as we possibly can. Yeah, I can see why they would want to stay as long as they could to before going into skilled care, which just as you suggested is a just a more constrained environment. 
Well, that and, and, and again, you're going through another change again. You know, I mean, this has become their home now for years in most cases. And so they know your staff, they know you. And so it's important for us to really, you know, I always say that's the biggest decision we ever make is make sure that we can't meet their needs, you know, because that's the biggest decision we make. So we have we have uh, a couple minutes and I wanted to touch on this. And I think we touched on this in the previous interview. And that's that, I mean, the previous interview with your mother, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mother-in-law. And your, and your mother-in-law wife. and your wife. While there are advantages to what's called the continuing care, we haven't talked much about it here, but um, I wanted you to address this. The continuing care is where someone goes into perhaps independent living. It could be assisted living, but it's a... It's a community that's designed to allow you to stay there all the way through the balance of your life. So they have, you know, on the campus, so to speak, they have skilled care. So you could go in at age 60 in perfect health and plan to spend the rest of your life there, no matter what your rate of decline was be, would be, because you, if you needed skilled care, it's there. You would kind of graduate to it. So you graduate from independent to, to assisted to, to skilled care. Those are called continuing care communities. And there are several of those options in the St. Louis area. Mm-hmm. Um, one concern I have about that, and I'm being a cynical lawyer here, and it's probably not fair. We <laughs> should have somebody on that has, that is affiliated with a continuing care facility. Uh, but one concern I would have is that it's most beneficial to them financially if you graduate. Uh, so that rather than as you, you have a strongest incentive to keep people with you as long as possible in assisted living before you would, you know, encourage them or they would in fact go to to skilled care. Whereas if you're if it's a single business, yeah, and is this too cynical? No. That that they you have an incentive to relinquish them the moment they qualify for long term care, because profitability is so much greater. Probably you trigger federal benefits. I could see maybe why you know somebody might think that, but I assure you, I don't think that. that You're happens. not. A, you would not allege somebody that that. who's been in this business forty years. I I do believe in the spirit of the caregiver. I mean everybody's same goal, I think, is the same as mine, and that is we have to always try to keep the resident in the least restrictive environment for as long as possible to make them thrive because nobody is going to thrive if they're in a higher level of care than they need at that time, right? They're always going to be wanting the others. Yeah. um, I will always believe that that does it. What I do see happen sometimes is like – let's say that you fractured a hip and you're going to need some really intensive therapy and we'll send somebody to skilled, um, that they keep them longer than what I feel like the resident wishes or what I'm seeing when I come out and do my assessment. Like, you know, she's walking 150 feet and she's transferring good. It's time to let her come home, but she has more days sometimes, Medicare days, um, so I always tell my families, you know, you be mom's advocate and watch for that because sometimes she, that can, can play into the mental aspect for the person. They start yeah. getting, thinking they're never going to, you know, it's right. been 25 days, I'm still here, you know. And so... Um, I mean, yeah, and I can see where, um, you know, you, you would be disinclined and I'm disinclined to impute that at least too oh, readily. But but in any case, I would say there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes on, and that's in part with the family's participation because they trigger Medicaid benefits and uh, some Medicare, if you can argue that you're in the process of improving their condition. So uh, uh, when, when everyone's participating in it, I still would argue that, and I think you just made this argument, that it's not in the best interest of the resident, even though you're triggering some federal money. I understand the temptation from a financial standpoint, but the quality of life, 
I mean, people need to spend a lot more time thinking about that than, than using their calculator. And if there's money at all for your mother or your grandmother, whatever it may be, to right. have them living in an environment such as assisted living where they can, as you said, the precondition is they have to be able to live there. So obviously if there's no choice, but that's not the situation I'm complaining about. I'm complaining about when when often the family in conjunction with others in the skilled care facility who they have professionals to assist, of course, in, in qualifying, uh, once they, they game the system, so to speak, and get the ADLs they need, um, so that they they can qualify for what is covered through Medicare and Medicaid, mainly Medicaid. Um, then it's the, the idea is well, of course you move them. Why wouldn't you? Because this is paid for and this isn't. Well, there are other things to think about. I mean, th- there's I don't see any way you can have the quality of life right. in a nursing home. And nursing homes now are much better. Don't get me wrong. Oh, I've been are. in some very nice nursing homes, but. All things being equal? It's not the same. This no. Would, this could be a whole segment on its own someday for you yeah. all. But this is, you know, probably the biggest reason why I I am so involved in Jeff City and in Missouri Assisted Living Association and I work with uh, the skilled side, which is healthcare facilities in Missouri. But there's not a program for assisted living, like I was telling you earlier. So it does force many times people into skilled that don't... Don't need to be there. But it's because it's the only reimbursement. So we have to do better with our legislators. And and I say this every time I go into Jeff City, but we have to do better and help them to see the difference in care. Because nationally, there's more people now in assisted living than there is in skilled. And it's only growing. And that's... The, again, goes back to the least restrictive environment. But the reason is there's no reimbursement program. You know, Missouri has what's called the personal care program and a Medicaid cash grant. That adds up in most cases to about 30-something dollars a month. I mean, you barely can get three meals a day for that. Right. And care providers can't provide care for 30-something dollars a month. I mean, they just can't. So... We have to get that reimbursement worked out so that people can stay in that other environment. But what happens is they go skilled because it is fully picked up, then the difference is fully picked up. And mm-hmm. it, it's. Yeah, you're right. That's a whole nother show. But, but at least I think for us to talk about the difference is that it's not simply a matter of arithmetic and accounting to make the decision do you want to put mom. That's right. in a in a nursing home when when she has the option of living in assisted living. So anyway, so so much we've covered yes. here. Yes. Oh, thanks. For I'm telling me. you. Um, next time, what we should do is we'll we'll um, we'll schedule it to talk about some of the the things that people can do to to cover the costs. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. I know they're more limited with assisted living, but I do think it's worth discussing mm-hmm. the ways in which people can help pay for it, improve costs. We've covered a lot of territory. We've made. The, I know we've gone longer this time than we normally go, but uh, you've been such a, a marvelous guest that yes. that Thanks we for uh, having me. Thank you. We we want to. We hope that you'll come back. Oh, anytime. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Thank you, Tim. To. Uh, this has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time. Take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Ellen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.